Hey guys, Mr. P. In this video, we're going to talk about biomes and aquatic ecosystems, what it means to be a biome, what are some physical features that each biome possesses, how do terrestrial biomes differ from aquatic ecosystems. So the first thing we need to talk about when we begin our discussion of biomes or natural biomes is what a biome is, and biomes are described in terms of their abiotic and biotic factors. So in previous videos, we've talked in depth about what abiotic and biotic factors are, but biotic factors are those things that are alive. So those would be plant and animal life. Each biome on the planet has a specific set of plants and animals that are well adapted to life in that particular area. And a lot of the adaptations that come about as a result of living in that biome uh, is dependent on the abiotic factors, such as weather, climate, precipitation, pH, temperature, those kinds of things. Every time we discuss a biome, we are also going to discuss a precipitation amount and a temperature. A lot of times you will see these graphs that correspond to data associated with one of the biomes, and it's a double axis graph. So you typically have the months of the year along the X, and on the Y it shows you precipitation in monthly precipitation, usually uh, in the unit or with the unit of millimeters. I have also seen them on centimeters. You're using the, the metric unit centimeter. But this will show you the months of the year and then will show you the precipitation amount per month and the average am annual temperature per month. So if you look at the key or the legend on this particular graph, it'll show you that the average temperature is depicted with this kind of orange line and the annual or the monthly precipitation is depicted with the blue bars. So you will see that in this particular biome, you will have an ambient temperature that spikes over the July, June, and uh, or June, July, and August months. So the summer, this is probably a northern hemisphere uh, biome and it decreases in our winter months. You will also see the precipitation increases along the same trajectory as the temperature. So this particular biome is going to receive more rain uh, during the summer months than it does during the winter months. But you will also notice that even though it looks like it might receive a lot of rain, it really is just in the 100 millimeters, which is not much. That is about 10 centimeters. So uh, very little rainfall for that particular month. What are the terrestrial biomes that we need to kind of key in on or make sure we understand? We have tropical rainforests, okay? Tropical rainforests are going to be those things that are typically uh, associated with large biodiversity, okay? They're going to have a canopy. They're gonna have incredibly tall trees. They're gonna be incredibly dense. Uh, they're going to have a lot of uh, different abiotic factors like warm year round. They're gonna be wet year round. They're gonna receive tons of annual rainfall. They're going to have really nutrient poor soils and are going to be really subjected to uh, large scale erosion. Uh, next would be the tropical dry forest. Okay, tropical dry forests are going to be very similar to the tropical rainforest. However, they have um, a kind of a, a decreased rainfall. So they are drier, they are less humid than the tropical rainforest, uh, but they will be year warm year round Okay, they will have usually an alternating wet and dry season, so they might have a lot of rainfall in certain parts of the year and no rainfall in other parts of the year, which is obviously different than the tropical rainforest, which is going to have large rainfall year-round. They also can be subjected to erosion uh, based on the really high amounts of rainfall, but do receive some dry weather, uh, unlike the tropical rainforest. The savanna is going to be kind of your typical uh, African grassland biome. That is going to be a biome that receives more seasonal rainfall and it's going to have a lot of really dry time as well. So it's going to receive a lot of rainfall usually during one month of the year and then will be relatively dry the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the year. It's warm, it has seasonal rainfall, it has compact soils, and there are frequent fires that are set by lightning that usually result in um, kind of some old scrubby brush clearing and some new grasses popping up. Desert, like the uh, savanna, are gonna be pretty arid. They're going to be even more arid though. They don't receive large rainfall ever. They're gonna have a lot of really dry weather. 
They're gonna have low precipitation. They're gonna have variable temperatures. So some of the temperature during the summer can be higher than the winter, but they also can have relatively high fluctuations in temp temperatures, even on a day-to-day -day scale. Um, temperatures typically in a desert will be high during the day and can get low during the night. Um, low precipitation uh, soils are rich in minerals, okay, but they're poor in organic material, meaning they have a lot of sand and very little dirt. Again, gives rise to that more arid uh, landscape. Temperate grassland is going to be uh, indicative of where we live in Kansas, okay? So it's going to be plains and prairies with really fertile, fertile soils. Uh, those soils will give rise to really good cropland. Some of the abiotic factors are warm to hot summers. We have cold winters. We are moderately seasonal precipitation, meaning we kind of get a lot of rain. I shouldn't say a lot, but we get enough rain to, um, to keep it green. Uh, we're not arid. We have good fertile soil. And we do have occasional fires, and that can be brought about by actual uh, controlled burnings or natural fires, but we don't get as many fires as the savanna. Temperate woodland is going to be more arid and more rugged. You're going into kind of the foothills of the mountains. There are large areas of grasses and wildflowers. You have warm, dry summers, cool, uh, cool moist winters, thin, nutrient-poor soils, and here you have periodic fires as well. You start getting into more of the coniferous trees as opposed to the deciduous trees, which you will see in the tropical and uh, or tropical rainforest and dry forests. Moving into more of the temperate forest. These are going to bring in the deciduous trees as well, but you also have a lot of um, coniferous trees moving kind of higher up into the mountains. There are usually cold to moderate winters. You do get warm summers. There are year-round precipitation, which is enough to support the, the large tree groves uh, that, that grow in this particular area. Next, you will have your um, kind of a different type of um, coniferous to, uh, forest, but this gets into more of the northern or northwestern coniferous forest. You will have mild, moist air. You do get abundant rainfall, um, enough to support these trees. Most of the trees are going to be coniferous, uh, which are the evergreen trees. You have mild temperatures. You have uh, winter and springs are pretty cold. You do have dry summers and you have really rocky soils and you have acidic soils and the soils are acidic because of all the pine needles which uh, drop the pH of the soil once they fall off the trees. Moving further north, uh, you get into a region called the taiga and the taiga is also referred to as a boreal forest. They have certain abiotic factors like long cold winters. They have short mild summers though, moderate precipitation, high humidity, acidic nutrient poor soils, again acidic because they are all coniferous, um, and usually will have some kind of uh, solid precipitation on the ground like snow, um, ice, that kind of thing. And then moving even farther north you move into the tundra and the tundra is an area that is characterized by a permafrost which means it is pretty much permanently frozen. You have no trees and that's because it's too cold and you typically don't have enough day length in order to support the trees. You also have a lot of lichens. Uh, there are strong winds here, low precipitation, short and soggy summers, long cold dark winters, and very thin soils, again characterized by that permafrost. So these are all of the terrestrial biomes. You need to have kind of a general idea of what they look like and some of the abiotic and biotic factors. In this video, I didn't particularly go through a lot of the animal species or a lot of the biotic factors that are going to inhabit these areas, but if you understand the precipitation and the temperatures, as well as some of the other abiotic factors, I think you can kind of get a picture or, um, or visualize the types of animals that would reside in these areas. Moving into the aquatic ecosystems, there are three that you need to be familiar with. Aquatic ecosystems are described primarily by the salinity that is the salt content, depth, so how deep the water is, temperature, how warm it is, flow rate, is it moving or is it still, and concentrations of dissolved nutrients. And there are three aquatic ecosystems, like I said, you need to know. There is a marine ecosystem, which is salt water. 
you have a freshwater ecosystem, which is freshwater, and then you have estuary ecosystems, which are a combination of freshwater and marine. So it has a decreased salinity uh, compared to the marine ecosystem, but it has an increased salinity compared to freshwater ecosystem. This is, or these are areas where freshwater dumps into the ocean, and so you have some of that mixing of fresh and salt water, which obviously drops the salinity. So marine ecosystems, first one we're going to talk about is the uh, marine ecosystem, okay? Um, there are some different zones that you need to be familiar with. Organisms are submerged during high tide and exposed to air during low tide. That is the intertidal zone. This is the area that will recede to low tide and will come back up to high tide. So during high tide, it will be covered with water. During low tide, it will be exposed to air, but organisms do live in this area. Um, obviously certain organisms, not every organism can live in that area. Uh, in that area. You have the continental shelf, which is kind of termed the coastal ocean. This will always be submerged, but is relatively uh, shallow. It is uh, often associated with a depth known as the photic zone, okay, which we'll get to in a minute. You have open ocean, which is everything out off the coast, which usually involves really, really deep water. And as this picture depicts, there are organisms that will live in the photic zone. You will also have a variety of organisms that live in the aphotic zone, and then you have organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean. And as you decrease um, down this picture or increase in depth, the organisms change in order to withstand higher and higher uh, pressures that are associated with deeper depths. Okay, the freshwater ecosystems, there are a variety of them. These are the things that are inside the coast, so on land. You have rivers and streams, you have lakes and ponds, and you have freshwater wetlands. And so all of these are different. What are some of the characteristics that are going to contribute to the features of these particular ecosystems? Well, rivers and streams are always moving and they often originate from underground sources. So typically rivers and streams are going to be fed by groundwater. Uh, there could be a, a situation which groundwater seeps through exposed uh, rock layers. Um, there can be natural springs. All of those often originate at underground sources. They have high dissolved oxygen and little plant life at the source and then it decreases as the water travels towards the sea. Uh, when it comes through the rock from underground, you typically have large, uh, high dissolved oxygen content and plant life and then it will, like I said, um, decrease as it moves down towards the sea. It also goes from an area of high elevation to an area of low elevation, meaning it's going with gravity downhill, which is why they're often moving. Lakes and ponds are not moving. The water typically flows in and out of the lakes, but the lake itself or the pond itself is uh, stationary, okay? Meaning there is less current in a lake and pond than there would be in a river or stream. Water circulates between the surface and the bottom during seasonal patterns called turnover. Okay. Seasonal patterns can make the top water kind of turn over or the bottom water kind of come back to the surface. And then freshwater wetlands are going to be water that either covers the soil or is present at or near the surface for at least part of the year. These are areas where water will flow into or stay in place. And they are very nutrient rich and highly productive and often serve as breeding grounds for many organisms like migratory birds um, as a way of maintaining kind of sta uh, stating stationary patterns, okay, or staging grounds on their way through their migrations. Purify water by filtering pollutants and prevent flooding. That is one of the biggest kind of benefits of these freshwater wetlands and why a lot of the wetlands around the country are protected because they do serve as a water purification hub and they help to prevent flooding and filter out pollutants from our freshwater supply. Estuaries, the last form of these aquatic ecosystems are areas where the fresh water is going to dump into the ocean which means there is some uh, freshwater and ocean water uh, mixing. Estuaries serve as spawning and nursery grounds for many ecological and commercially important fish and uh, shellfish. Because they have decreased salinity, they often have increased productivity uh, for a variety of biodiversity. 
a lot of sharks will come in because they serve as more protection. There's a lot more um, habitat for young fish or young sharks to come in and kind of hide in, like the mangrove swamps. Uh, serve as a lot of habitat for a lot of biodiversity. That's it for this video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments or bring them to class. Like the video. See ya.